Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. When Israel looks north towards the two neighboring countries yet to sign peace agreements with the Jewish state, it also looks to the east. That is, of course, because whatever happens in the frontiers uh, with Syria and Lebanon is inspired and even directed by the Ayatollah regime in Tehran. That is why Israel takes a holistic approach to its northern frontier, viewing attacks launched at its Galilee and Golan Heights districts as part of the Iranian-Israeli confrontation. What then lies behind the recent conflagration north of the border? To help us analyze it, we're joined from northern Israel by Major General in Reserve Gilshan Akwen, who's an IDF uh, Army Corps commander. Thank you for joining us, sir. Okay, thank you. Also joining us from central Israel is Brigadier General in Reserve uh, Doron Gavish, who is the IDF's former air defense chief. Thank you for joining us as well, General. Thank you for having me. And uh, with us in the studio, as uh, always, is our TV7 editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren, uh, who is the host of Watchmen Talk, Proud and Play, and so much more. Amir, give us a broader understanding on Israel's current challenges amid the various developments, of course, vis-à-vis uh, -vis Israel's northern sector. So, as you said, uh, we are talking about Lebanon and Syria. Many years ago, Lebanon used to be part of Syria. Then it um, uh, came under Syria's control for um, all uh, uh, purposes. And now they are two separate nations, but they are uh, influenced uh, by Iran. In Lebanon via Hezbollah, in Syria because Bashar al-Assad needs uh, uh, outside support, which he gets from Russia, but also uh, from Iran. Now, um, earlier this week, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, spoke uh, about the Israeli security challenges, and he focused um, on the Northern Front, and um, in a very uh, extraordinary case regarding Israeli policy over the last several years, threatened the Assad regime in Syria if uh, it enables Israel's uh, uh, enemies uh, in the Golan Heights or across the border from the Golan Heights to strike at Israel. Now, this was uh, uh, a rare expression uh, by an Israeli leader because Israel basically uh, decided to coexist with Assad. It prefers Assad to other forces in Syria. Syria has become either a no man's land or an all man's land. There are so many elements there, uh, some of them only taking part in intra-Syrian uh, affairs, but some of them uh, hostile to Israel, uh, Iranian forces, Iranian proxies, uh, Shiite militias, uh, and the like. So Israel is trying to um, uh, form some coherent policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran, which also has to do with Hezbollah in Lebanon, even though Hezbollah may not have known about the recent Hamas attack um, on uh, Israel's north, and regarding Syria also to uh, foil attempts uh, by various groups to strike Israel. Indeed. Uh, General Aquin, I'd like to start with you. When we're looking at uh, the Northern Front, obviously, uh, the last week was a good reminder of uh, the various challenges uh, presented to Israel on that front. Uh, nevertheless, it seems like uh, with a lack of, of a coherent policy or a coherent strategy, uh, focusing predominantly on a, I'd like to call it a bandage tactic of uh, the campaign between the wars, it seems like operational successes do not really live up to the current expectations and the deterrence uh, that Israel enjoyed for an extensive period of time uh, did not really provide for a true um, uh, block of, of uh, the latest altercations with the Assad regime, obviously uh, at the behest of the Islamic Republic of Iran, trying to change the, the uh, game uh, or the name of the game in, in the various uh, uh, exchanges of fire that we saw. Uh, to what degree is this now a true new reality, or is uh, the Assad regime still deterred nonetheless? No, actually, we are really facing a new reality that's demanding from the Israeli side to design a new uh, paradigm of strategical uh, approach. Uh, basically, you spoke about the 
keyword deterrence um, actually we can really learn something very important regarding that uh, word deterrence the Israeli deterrence is actually now captured in a catch because with all the Israeli uh, superiority of IDF the main uh, catch is the following tension and Hezbollah and Iran are absolutely aware about it and trying to exploit it. The tension is the following. Uh, Israel, of course, make all, making all effort not to escalate to a war. On the other side, the situation now brought Israel to recognize the danger that every action of Israel as a retaliation could bring the whole system to escalation without control that even it could come to a real war. So in that tension, Israel really finding itself in a catch. Therefore, we are aware about the constraint not to attack directly in Lebanon, not, of course, not to attack Hezbollah forces. This will es escalate. This became a, a very crucial uh, principle in the game. On the other side, Israel can attack in Syria, and in Syria, it is a new open game, but yet it is not creating uh, the desired deterrence. This is a basic capture, a, a catch in which Israel captured it. Indeed. General Gavish, uh, of course, with uh, vast amounts of statistical missiles uh, uh, in Lebanon, but also in Syria. Uh, the the growing number of precision-guided munitions is, of course, a cause for concern. But uh, nonetheless, it remains a small uh, portion of that uh, northern deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Israel. To what degree do you see, uh, also in light of uh, what happened last week with uh, the various uh, exchanges of fire, uh, the Iron Dome aerial defense system, which you integrated into the IDF uh, under your command uh, has, of course, had once again very impressive successes. Nonetheless, uh, it was only a very small uh, exchange rather than something that could truly overwhelm Israeli uh, uh, capabilities at such a place. Is this something that Israel is still working to um, ratchet up or bolster in the event of, of all-out conflagration? Uh, well, of course, the, the Iron Dawn or the defense of Israel is, is a part of, uh, I would say, a greater strategy, uh, which uh, have a few pillars. Uh, one of them is our attack capabilities. The other one is deterrence, uh, alert, and then the defense, uh, which is a passive defense and an offense defense. So from an operational point of view, when we are looking on uh, the way that uh, Israel is fighting against uh, missiles and rockets, we have to take in concern the the full package, I would say, uh, or the full uh, strategy of uh, how to fight them. And this is what we saw. We saw some uh, uh, some attacks and uh, we saw some uh, some uh, deterrence, I would say, uh, um, um, uh, ways of, uh, well, let's say, let's say this way, that uh, deterrence or to trying to, uh, to bring back the, the deterrence, it comes up with uh, some actions and also some uh, statements. Um, I fully agree with the uh, General Akwen. I think that um, it is, a, 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 I would say, something a bit new that what we saw in the past. And I think that from a strategic way, we would have to be, we would have to react to it. Uh, the last thing that I think it's important to mention is that uh, the. Uh, what we saw, and again from the operational uh, side, what we saw in the north uh, was uh, something that was tried by the Hamas, by the Palestinian organizations this time, from Lebanon, from Syria, and from Gaza. They tried to attack, let's say, it, uh, from uh, three different directions, and uh, this is also something uh, a bit new. Uh, but you are right because from the operational point of view, it uh, we, could, we couldn't we can't say that they, it was a success from their part because uh, most of the interceptions were most of the missiles were intercepted. Uh, we have to remember that what they shot from Syria, one of them fell in Syria, the other one in Jordan. So it is not yet the precise uh, missiles that uh, we know that the Hezbollah have. This is something different. But there are 
operating from areas uh, with uh, um, uh, the Iranians and the Hezbollah allowing them uh, working uh, from operating from from those areas. And Israel is uh, sending uh, signals, uh, as we mentioned uh, before, uh, to Syria directly this time that uh, we expect you to control what, uh, what is happening in your area. Indeed. Mr. Owen, of course, next week uh, on Tuesday, we will discuss Israel's multi-sector challenges, something that uh, will provide also uh, with the help of both our uh, distinguished panelists, General Akoen and General Gavish, uh, a more holistic overview of the various challenges at hand. But when we're looking at the Northern Front, what you also uh, touched on in your uh, introductory uh, uh, analysis or overview is that Hezbollah was not aware that Hamas is going to fire those uh, 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 34 rockets uh, from Lebanon, from Shiite-controlled territory into Israel, uh, something that caught it off guard. Was this an attempt by the Islamist Hamas organization uh, with certain diminished coordination, of course, uh, with Palestinian Islamic Jihad to somewhat tighten the ranks between the, the so-called axis of resistance, how they call themselves, uh, all those forces that seek to combat Israel? I can give you a definitive answer, perhaps. <laughs> now, um, you talk about tightening uh, the ranks. Even within Hamas itself, the ranks are not uh, so tight. You have Salah al raburi who went to uh, Lebanon to meet with Hassan Nasrallah or Ismail Haniya. Um, Salah al raburi was kicked from Turkey and lives today that's, in Beirut. That's so right. So you have Aruri and Haniya, and you have Muhammad Def and Yahya Sinwar in Gaza. They are not necessarily on the same page. You have at least four major players in the um, uh, leadership of Hamas, each pulling a bit um, to another um, direction. But yes, perhaps it was uh, a crude attempt by someone uh, in Hamas to draw Hezbollah in. Um, Hassan Nasrallah did not like it. He did not like either of the two possibilities, that he all of a sudden decided to launch a campaign against Israel, or that he was not aware of what is happening under his uh, nose. So um, we will see whether Nasrallah now manages to impose uh, some, some order and discipline. However, the word deterrence, the term deterrence that um, all of three of you uh, have used, um, has been spoiled in the Israeli strategic jargon. When Prime Minister and Defense Minister Ben-Gurion spoke about deterrence, he meant an Israeli attempt to deter Arab armies from launching full-scale war. There was really no effort, because it was futile, to deter uh, Arab gangs or Arab individuals from launching um, terror acts. Some of them were infiltrators who wanted to go home to the villages um, which they left under voluntarily or under duress in 1948. There was no uh, real um, possibility of deterring the um, uh, neighboring governments uh, from uh, doing anything about it. What Israel tried to do in the 1950s was to put pressure on the Jordanian army, for instance, so that it will try to block the uh, border. Deterrence uh, was supposed to be kept for existential threats, for full-scale invasion. Invasion at the time by ground forces was the major threat. This was before the rocket and missile age. And Israel um, has uh, spoiled it all by reacting. For instance, in 2006, the attack and abduction of soldiers by Hezbollah on the Lebanese borders called, caused Israel to react in such a way which started the war. But it was Israel's decision to, to react. Israel could have decided not to retaliate that very morning uh, and escalate uh, into a war. Now, earlier this week, 
what we had in the United States, in Kentucky, was the Louisville attack. Five or six people were killed. This is similar to a major terror act in Israel. But Israel finds itself, for some reason, having to, to take it as a major national security concern. It is not. It is personal security, current security, not um, a basic security issue. And Israel must rethink its policy. Well, I think the Louisville attack, if we talk about that particularly, was conducted by a psychopath uh, with psychological issues. Yeah, here in Israel, predominantly, it's conducted by psychopaths for nationalistic motivated issues. No, but also in the Arab sector. You, ha you have um, uh, passion killings or, or some other revenge killings uh, every week. And, and we... Uh, uh, Which the security establishment here differentiates. Yes, no, no, in the Arab sector, Arabs against Arabs in Israel. Of course. So, so um, it's, a, it's a fact of life. Um, since time immemorial, people will kill, whether for national or religious reasons or for personal uh, motives. And Israel shouldn't um, uh, look at each terror act in the West Bank or even in Tel Aviv as a major national security threat. Indeed. Well, uh, obviously, public opinion does have to do a lot but, with yes, but the it perception is not the, of the Yes, but it terrorists. is not deterrable. Indeed. Uh, General Cohen, I'd, I'd like to ask you from, from your perspective, when you look at the Northern Front, what are the key elements that challenge Israel at this stage that need to be addressed immediately rather than the medium to long term? And just uh, follow what was just emphasized by Amir, we must uh, take aside uh, an action of freedom from that uh, uh, concept of deterrence. Actually, we are too much uh, inside that uh, uh, stupidness of that uh, concept because not everything could be managed by that concept uh, for example, uh, in the public opinion, uh, the decision of the government, the cabinet, to retaliate in a moderate way is criticized. They are really expecting to something more crucial, uh, bringing better effect, and they are all speaking about whether at all the deterrence was uh, rebuilt like it is a physical entity that we can measure it, uh, like the water in the, in the Sea of Galilee, that we can measure the height of it and uh, to supply more water if it is going down. It's actu actually not like that, and we must uh, really take a step outside of this catch of uh, speaking regarding deterrence. It means that Israeli government must explain to itself and to the people that even if we want to take a risk to retaliate in a way that will bring escalation even to a war, we have to decide to initiate about the appropriate time, the appropriate uh, preparation that must be made for that, not to be like a Pavlovic dog that uh, react automatically. Actually, what we have in Lebanon is a threat. And what was uh, really achieved by Hezbollah is a mutual deterrence. They have awareness why to be afraid from a, a massive war with, a war with Israel and the same about Israel. We are really recognizing the risk of war with the massive destructions that all missiles of Lebanese Hezbollah could bring to Israeli cities. So the mutual deterrence is here. And here we must create and to design a new concept regarding the way we are managing ourselves in that mutual deterrence. Therefore, the role of Hamas in Lebanon, making a new turn to the story, because with the mutual deterrence between Israel and Hamas, a new actor that entering 
to the system, and with Hamas, we yet didn't uh, find ourselves in a mutual deterrence, but we are not really pre- well prepared to attack Hamas because it is not yet well uh, uh, prepared with uh, targets that we can uh, attack, just refugee camps like Rashadia. So what we are going to attack? Here we are in a new problem with a proxy that yet is not really could be treated as a well-built force to attack it. Indeed, of course, uh, the various uh, challenges related to this, uh, considering Hamas is not well established in Lebanon, as you mentioned. But uh, when we look, and I'd like to ask uh, you, General Kavish, when we look and establish an analogy between uh, the ongoing war raging in the north uh, uh, i.e., uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia, and take that as an example, In uh, even though, of course, there are so many differences that uh, we can't really establish a true analogy from there. Um, if all of the rockets of Hezbollah and whatever is found currently on the northern front is directed at Israel and would be fired in, in uh, the, the tens of thousands of rockets a day, uh, ultimately uh, they would run out within a week if we look at the firepower utilized currently in Ukraine. Uh, and therefore they will have to have certain uh, fire discipline uh, from the Northern Front towards Israel, which would then prolong uh, this uh, conflict into a war of, of potentially, if it's 30 days or 40 uh, days, or I don't know how long they expect it to be, uh, which Israel does not intend to allow the other side to achieve. Uh, To what degree do you see this as a multi-sector challenge, if if I may? Of course, we'll discuss more uh, next week about the multi-sector threats. But uh, today, Israel regards both Lebanon and Syria as one front rather than two separate fronts that it needs to deal with. Well, it it is uh, it, it is again a challenge, and um, you know, looking on uh, Ukraine Russia war, um, we could learn some lessons uh, from there. But as you say rightly, um, there is I wouldn't take the exact. Uh, I would say um, what, what happening over there is not exactly what is happening in in our area. It is mu- much more complex. In, in our area because the different actors within the system here in Israel and the, the difference that you have to, uh, to to try and make in the way that you are retaliating. Hezbollah is not Syria. Syria is not uh, the Hamas. Each one of them have his own interest and of course the Iranian which are uh, fighting through uh, proxies and so on. So it's a, it's a completely different situation I would say that and it is an easy situation from this point of view in, in the Ukraine because there's Ukraine and Russia and, and those are uh, the two. So, but but yes, the multi-directional for, for sure, this is, a, this is a challenge. But we also have to say that uh, we prepared ourselves for this. I mean, um, during the, 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 war, the, the war games that is being done for years and years here in Israel, talking about the war between the wars and others, it's, it's not that we are not preparing ourselves to, to this situation. So, so I don't think that, you know, this is something completely uh, new from the point of view of us um, preparing ourselves for, for such a situation. Of course, it is uh, uh, much more uh, complex, as we said uh, before. And, and, about the, and about the Israeli doctrine, I, I, I think that we should uh, really look at it from a perspective of, um, I would say, long perspective, not only the situation that we are currently in, because we have to remember that this is a fight that is going on for years and years and years. And and, and really the perspective of uh, looking at it and, and the different components within our strategic um, uh, or, or, or strategic way of thinking, uh, this is something should, that should be considered and looked at upon uh, long years. And, and from here, I'm not sure that I completely agree that we should... Uh, uh, forget the deterrence issue. I think it still should be part 
of a long, of a big strategy, as, as I said uh, before, attack, defense, uh, decisiveness, and uh, alert, and uh, all those uh, different components. And uh, sometimes you uh, work with one, sometimes you work with the other, sometimes you work with uh, with all of them. Uh, but going back to Klausovich, we all remember that uh, the fight is only part of the politics, and uh, we want to keep this area quiet as much as we can. I don't think that uh, we have any aspirations or we believe that uh, peace could be done uh, with, the, um, uh, with the Hezbollah or with the Syria and the situation that we are in and not in the, with the Hamas. So we have to, um, I would say, to, to see how do we contain this uh, situation. And, uh, and it's, um, it's a hard decision um, because we could... Uh, engage into a full-scale uh, war and ask ourselves, okay, what do we want to gain? I mean, are we going back to square one? Or do we understand that this is the situation around us and now let's try and contain it? By the way, I think that, again, talking about uh, deterrence, what happened a year and a half ago in the Gaza Strip was Israel uh, changing the paradigm because we were the one that uh, decided on our time, on uh, our terms uh, to engage uh, a short campaign uh, in Gaza, which I think uh, uh, was a successful one. Indeed. Well, we'll discuss okay, uh, more of that. Uh, unfortunately, we we have run out of time, uh, General Aquin. Uh, of course, uh, General Klausovich knew what he was talking about, but uh, I'd like to... One, one word uh, regarding uh, Netanyahu's threat to Assad. The Russians will not like it. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank General uh, Akoen, General Kavish, and Mr. Owen for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank all of you at home, from here in Jerusalem. Until next time, Shalom. <laughs>